Welcome, everyone. I'm Bill Hannafin, the Managing Editor of The Wise Marketer. Got a huge crowd today. And I'm so proud to be here hosting today's webinar with Bond Brand Loyalty. Um, it's titled today, The New Decade, New Norms, and New Expectations. Get to know the Loyalty Report 2021. So if you don't know the Loyalty Report, it's in its 11th year. And it's been produced by Bond in partnership with Visa. The Loyalty Report is clearly in my opinion, and ours, the industry's most comprehensive and long-standing study of its kind on customer engagement, loyalty attitudes, and market dynamics. This year's report is particularly kind of a blockbuster. It features an assessment of 450 loyalty programs by more than 25,000 North American consumers across a whole range of sectors. So from payments, retail, grocery, delivery, gas, dining, hotel, airline, coalition, and probably a couple of more that I haven't thought of. So we've, we've got a very broad and complete representation of consumer opinion. So in, in recognition of the unpredictable year that we've all been living through and, and um, hopefully emerging from, the loyalty report itself in its 11th year made some changes to provide a new blueprint for brands who are looking to thrive and lead as consumers form new norms and create some lasting bonds with the brands that earn their loyalty. So our friends at Bond are here with us today. Bond, if you don't know, is a global customer experience and loyalty management firm, um, highly reputed, well-known, and does excellent work. And, um, and they've created this very unique report. So to help us unpack the highlights from, from the report this year, we've got Phil Rubin, Executive Vice President, Global Insights and Strategic Partnerships, and Michelle Sakara Yi, who is Senior Loyalty Consulting Director. Welcome to you both. How are you? Hey, Bill. Great to see you again. Great. Hi, Michelle. everyone. <laughs> nice to see you. Very good. Great. Glad to have you here. The format for today is for Phil and Michelle to share for about 30 minutes, 40 minutes. We'll see how that goes, after which we'll engage in Q&A for about 10 minutes. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Bill. We, uh, there's a ton of information and insights in the loyalty report. As usual, for those of you who are familiar with it, you know it's a two-hour presentation at, at a minimum. But we're going to cover a couple of highlights today. We're going to reference, obviously, give you a little more context on the study, the 10 years plus this, this past year, so 11 years, one louder for all you Spinal Tap fans. Importantly, we're going to talk a little, a good bit at the beginning about this notion of bi-directional loyalty, which we really uncovered and will unpack today. Uh, new insights and incredibly important. Likewise, the value of time. Time is critically important, not a new idea, but we've quantified it. And tiers. And tiers are important as a way to differentiate customers. We know tiers, they've been around for years. Uh, but there's a lot of misunderstanding and misconceptions, and we're going to clarify some of that today. And then we're going to talk about tender as a good segue following tears. And then, like Bill said, we're going to open it up for questions. The loyalty report, this 11th year, is really incredible because the 10th year, 2020, came out of market literally more or less the day that everything shut down in March of 2020. So what you're going to see is a new clean look at what is 11 years of longitudinal insights inside of the loyalty report reflecting this past year, which is obviously fill in your own adjective, but really what it is to us, it's a new set of norms. It's not a new normal. And I think that's probably more true today than it has been uh, sadly over the last few months. This is the most comprehensive study of its kind on known customers, loyalty and engagement. Importantly, it's not just the size of the sample base this year, 25,000 in North America. But the fact that we go deep across nearly 100 attributes across all these different industry sectors. And that gives us not only the here and now actionable insights that you must know today and going forward, but it also allows us to go back and provide context and trending and other insights across the, the previous 10 years. One thing we did for this year and, and we do each year is go deep into a couple of different uh, topics. The important ones that we're going to talk about today are the notion of loyalty, being a loyalty brand, and we're going to talk about tiers. There are a bunch of other chapters in the loyalty report 
Uh, we'll show you at the end how you can get more information about TLR, get a custom presentation, get all kinds of actionable insights from that. But what we want to start off with is this idea that we're going to talk about for the first third, roughly, of, of this afternoon, which is the notion of a brand being, a brand being loyal to customers. And part of what we do when we develop the loyalty report is not just do our own primary survey of consumers, we also survey marketers. And when we did that this year and we posed this question to them, we found, not surprising to us, but maybe to some of you, a real disconnect between the marketer's view of how loyal their brand is to customers. You can think about that as how customer-centric are they versus the view that consumers have, which is really almost just the opposite in terms of consumers not really seeing or feeling, which is really important when you're talking about loyalty, they're not feeling that loyalty from the brand. Michelle, you, as part of our consulting practice, you're in the field with clients literally every day across a number of different categories. How does this resonate with you? This is actually quite interesting, Phil. You know, part of the work we do, as you know, is we run workshops both with marketers, but also with their consumers. And there are two things that I'd say we continuously see. Um, one is marketers often undervalue the importance of some motivators or barriers. And, you know, often it's a known asset or a pain point. We aren't really identifying anything new, but the impact it has on behavior is often surprising to them. And the second is the way in which marketers are engaging these consumers on these motivators, right? Often a feature or a benefit is brought into the market and the offering is the exact same experience across all their different customer segments, across demographics, versus paying attention to the uniqueness of how each of those segments are motivated differently by that same feature. So really it's about slight tweaks to the way an idea gets implemented. It's paying attention to how different customers um, experience and voice and value different motivators that can actually make a lot of difference. So I'm not surprised to see this divide, but more and more marketers are starting to pay attention to these cues. And if <laughs> this is not scripted, but this notion of paying attention to customers is at the heart of what loyalty marketing is, right? Loyalty marketing by definition, or at least by our definition or one definition, is paying attention to customers and treating them accordingly, which denotes that loyalty from the brand to the customer and translates into better experiences and all those things. We're going to talk more about that. One bit of context, and I think reflective of both the disconnect and also what we've gone through in the last 18 months for all kinds of reasons, including a lot of reasons that were formed well before the pandemic, is we saw this real uptick in terms of the number of enrollments in, in programs, which had been relatively steady. Likewise, the activation rate in those programs we saw this real uptake and there's no shortage of data out there in terms of how many consumers tried new brands, switched. Uh, and a lot of those behaviors, a lot of those broken habits, reformed habits stuck. So, so this, is not, uh, this is not a static marketplace for brands and consumers anymore. Again, back to this notion of brands showing loyalty to customers. We know that customers will show loyalty to brands. We've quantified that in our own research in the past, and that number is north of 80% of consumers believe they're loyal. Now, when you contrast that with that data point that we looked at in terms of brands showing consum consumers' loyalty and consumers playing back that they feel that, that's missing. And why? This is this, is this notion that the model, has, the construct has to flip from where it started 40 years ago, which is show your value as a customer, we'll treat you better, and then in turn, we'll expect you to be more loyal. It's, it, there has to be the reciprocity between the brand and the customer, and it has to expand beyond transactional value. We knew that, the, and there were all kinds of research, including ours, that pointed to 2020 really being this seminal year where things were going to flip, the flip being focusing on experiences and, and experiences matter, mattering more than things as in terms of driving consumer choice. What we saw is that COVID 
and the impact of that and, and what it did to the marketplace really, really accelerated that. And, and so that's where understanding the importance of the, co the connection point between what the program does and what the brand represents and how the brand performs is not a nice to have anymore. This notion of integration that's been talked about since Don Schultz wrote the book on integrated marketing, you know, a couple of dozen years ago is hugely important. And what we did for this year is, is really break that down, break down the role of the program and the brand with a new focus in, in terms of an outcome, which previously was overall satisfaction. Now it's the, an outcome that matters more to the C-level. It matters more in terms of driving top-line profitable growth, that being Cheryl Wallet. And so to borrow a phrase from Emily Collins at Forrester, who talked about it wasn't enough to be a company with a loyalty program, you had to be a loyal, loyalty company. Well, if you're going to be a loyalty company, let's extend that further. you got to be a loyalty brand. And if you're a loyalty brand, that means by definition, you've got to deliver loyal customer experiences so that the experiences themselves are intrinsically, extrinsically, and emotionally rewarding, not just satisfying, and they're sought to be reciprocal. So to break this down a little bit, again, we'll back, we'll back up from, from this outcome that we focused on, Share Wallet, where you see the program and the brand both being key drivers. And what we do with, because we have such a rich data set is we do a neural network analysis and we broke down a set of drivers for loyalty. And yes, well, we, we've covered, you know, 85 plus attributes and, and a similarly very large number of drivers. We've organized them into a manageable framework that is really easy for marketers as well as non-marketers in, in large client organizations and large enterprises to wrap their heads around and focus on, starting with these two foundational drivers of safety and security. That's one driver, not two, safety and security together. The other being relevant communications. These are then tie into this super enabler, the value, the driver of time. Time being even more important than it was pre-COVID because we all realized just really how important time was and making the most of our time with people we love, with people we care about, and yes, with brands that we care about. Laddering from those, we get into these experiential drivers of recognition or know me, learning, which means keeping your customers informed on how to get the most value out of their relationship with your brand, and giving them access, unlocking opportunities for them to experience the best of what they can, whether it's directly from the brand or from a partner or from a community. And that, yes, there's still a place for financial rewards, but, but those are really secondary to, especially in terms of driving real loyalty to those other experiential drivers. So to simplify the look, and I want to give Michelle a chance to weigh in on this in terms of these, these seven drivers and how they work. Here's a simpler way to look at it in terms of the five drivers that with a lot of variability anchored by these two foundational drivers, safety and relevant communications. Michelle? Yeah, no, actually, so when I look at this, you know, I'd say most marketers are doing all of these things, but the gap I see is often they're considering these drivers in silo of each other, right? It's almost treated as check marks. It's like, check, yep, got learning covered in our onboarding communications or, got time covered in our mobile pay experience. But where we typically advise marketers is really to evaluate how these are all interconnected with each other. And that's really where you start seeing that incrementality, that satisfaction of the experience. So what I mean by that is, you know, if you take learning, <clears throat> that it isn't just occurring in a moment in time when customers first interact or join a program. Yes, that's often where the component lives, right, in the onboarding journey. And if a brand is truly cued in on knowing their customers, it's about finding those continuous moments in the journey, right, to teach them about the program, uh, when they should be reminding them about value and how to get value in the program, or communicating, benef communicating benefits that are more relevant at this particular time in their journey versus maybe where they were six months ago. 
And the same can be said about time, access, or even financial rewards. Um, you know, you as my customer may need a financial reward because of what's motivating to you at this point right now, but someone at the exact same point in their journey may be more motivated by access or a frictionless experience. So it's really looking at all these in tandem. Um, but what I wanted to call out that I love being represented here is safety because it's really become top of mind in a particular sector over the last, you know, I'd say couple of months, if not longer. Um, and usually when we used to talk about safety, it was more from a data handling or usage perspective, or of course, physical safety for brands. But it's getting a lot of traction in beauty retail right now um, in terms of the safety of ingredients that are used in products. So this is just a good reminder of how all of these things ladder into what is a brand's role in the notion of safety, um, as well as a retailer's role who's selling those brands and the accountability they're taking for all of these. So I think those are good cues as foundational elements. And of course, I think we're continuously going to see the usage and integration of these um, evolve as we go. You know, with this one, when we go a level deeper to see those drivers and how these customer expectations map out, it's actually quite a huge opportunity for brands because what we see is customers have ingrained in terms of expecting a loyalty program to only fulfill on financial drivers and financial moments of satisfaction. But what we just saw is satisfaction is actually dependent much more heavier on the experience than just on those monetary rewards. So I really think by merchandising the experiences that a brand offers under the umbrella of a loyalty program, you can actually get more credit for the value you're providing and it also helps with creating those elements of reward and recognition. And I know we're going to touch on recognition later in this, but when it comes to brand love, recognition is really a core and centralized part of how we achieve um, that satisfaction with the member base. Yeah, and 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 so just to build on that, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back to you in, in one second. A great example of everything that Michelle just talked about. And of course, one of the things that, that I think a lot of you are aware of that we do with the loyalty report is we rank brands and programs. And a new, the new way that we're doing it this year, again, tying back to that driver analysis that we showed a few slides ago, is looking at sort of the combination, the interaction between loyalty to the program, loyalty to the brand, and then actually measuring the reciprocity of the brand back to the customer. And Adidas is such a fascinating uh, example and case study for anybody involved in this kind of work to look at, because number one, it's a relatively new program, but number two, as a relatively new program, especially with the formidable competitor that, that Adidas has um, in, in Portland, that being Nike, um, who was, who was, way ahead in terms of time, the, the, the lead time that they had with Nike membership. Here's Adidas coming up and leading all brands in terms of that measure of the brand loyalty to the member. And um, they do that with tears. But Michelle, you probably have, have some other things you want to you talk about here. Yeah, I think what stands out to me with the Adidas program is really what I just said. It's the importance they have put on building, actually consciously building in moments of recognition and how they've used that to also gamify their tier levels and status. And that's a significant distinction between their program and the one you mentioned, which is Nike's membership program, both of which prioritize experience over transaction. But it's really the way Adidas has consciously put the customer central to it. And I think a way uh, a takeaway from marketers here is really to evaluate the touch points in your member journey and consider how often are you offering recognition. You know, when you evaluate your features or your life cycle, is the focus mainly on early engagement and win back, which is quite typical, actually, or are you generating engagement uh, beyond spend and frequency in the in-between? We could, we could spend literally an entire webinar session just talking about what we've, what we've just covered. But in the interest of giving you guys more of a taste of what's in the loyalty report for this year, 
we're going to wrap this section. I think uh, hopefully you guys begin to really appreciate the value of this reciprocity and the integration between the program and the brand. Um, one question that came in through the chat was, was about um, being a loyalty brand versus just a loyalty program within a brand and, and the value in messaging loyalty exclusive benefits versus other offers and promotions. Um, there's no question that messaging loyalty exclusive benefits, especially in a, in a, in a world where first party data is so critically important, it really underscores promoting that membership attachment to the brand as a mechanism for both a differentiated and a better experience. Um, but again, that's part of the opportunity for better integration. No coincidence that we could have talked about that for a long time. And now we're gonna talk about literally time as the super enabler, which is partly a cue for me to speed things up a little bit so we can get through all this great, uh, great content discussion. Again, time was a big deal. We talked about time as a loyalty currency going back three and four years. We, we saw this exponential uptick in time over the pandemic. Again, not surprising. It was just a change in the slope of that, of, of that, that change curve, that, that prioritization curve. One of the categories, quick service restaurants, QSR, um, where you see the value of time really manifest itself, especially as, as brands shifted and, and businesses pivoted during the pandemic. Again, these were things that were happening before. They're happening even more. Panera and McDonald's and other, you know, Chick-fil-A too, being great examples where they're, they're, they're prioritizing drive-through only, double drive-through footprints for their physical stores. And of course, McDonald's, with all of its outsized investments in digital acceleration, digital transformation. Um, you know, McDonald's, interestingly enough, having just launched my McDonald's rewards, was in the top of uh, was in the top three in terms of QSR brands for this year. And that was before they launched their loyalty program. So it shows the value of a digitally enhanced experience, but it's not just a QSR thing, is it, Michelle? No, and before I get into that, I actually want to address a question that came through the chat in, do we know, do we feel like the recent uptake in loyalty membership is due to the fact that a lot of convenience services like shipping or curbside require membership? And I think that fits into this conversation here around time and digital. Um, because yes, I think that, and it goes back in terms of, you know, brands offering these experiences and then building them back under that umbrella. And it's really looking at where can we offer that notion of seamlessness, frictionless experiences um, in order to create access or create time. And, you know, that's all part of it. But I think the important part is as we see more and more use of customers moving to the online world, not only are we thinking about the optimal experience in terms of seamlessness and friction, but I think it's paying attention to also the channel of these experiences, you know, because the objective is very different. Think about how you make purchases on the web versus the app versus on social, even between social channels. We each have different transactional motivators and different experience expectations. So I think a key is to avoid using the same strategy across all. Um, and another factor at play, which a lot of marketers talk about, is just managing digital expectations across global regions. There's huge variances in terms of customer adaptation and expectations, right, with different interactions that are more mainstream or gamified or use of more AI um, than maybe in North America. So marketers now do need to have multiple strategies at play. But what's underutilized is also leveraging a strategy you have for one market that may be ahead to really drive insight and create opportunity for an up-and-coming market. It's a great point. I mean, I keep thinking about what Starbucks did with mobile order and pickup and store and how that changed everything on the heels of Amazon Prime and, and just how just the speed and rate of change that's happening. And I think, you know, the, the big takeaway for everybody here is 
if you're not focused on speed, seamless execution for the customer in, in consuming whatever their transaction is with your brand, you, you need to be out in front or you're going to get left behind because things are, mm-hmm. things are moving way too fast. Uh, in the interest of not me moving too, too fast, but moving just fast enough, let's talk about tiers. We've talked about the importance of recognition in, in terms of loyalty. And yes, tiers have been around literally for four decades, right? The airline started with the tiers. Um, but the reality of tiers is there's a lot of complexity to tiers. You've got benefits. How do you ladder benefits? How do you manage against terms and conditions, eligibility, achievability, upgrades, downgrades? Who gets grandfathered? We, we've seen so much of this, you know, lately with with uh, with the airlines continue and, and other companies continue to extend elite status with what's going on. And how do you do it in a way that measures incrementality? Well, it's important to understand that, that in addition to, rec- to the recognition, there is a carrot aspect to the tiers because they're motivating to consumers. And interestingly enough, they're motivated whether there's a, pr- whether, whether the brand they're engaging with has a tier or not. It also goes to being willing to pay a fee, premium loyalty being a thing, you know, transactional businesses want subscription revenue and vice versa. Uh, But it does make things more important consistently. And again, back to those key drivers of share share of wallet and the value in being really perceived as a customer centric brand, a brand loyal to the customer, the lift that tiers deliver are significant, which means it's not just about the transactional value, because what we see is that the higher up you go in the tiers, the less value that is placed on the financial rewards, the more value that consumers place on the experience. And I know there's a question in the chat about how do you transform a loyalty program into a loyalty brand and, and, and reverse or, or pay back that loyalty to the customer? Tears are a great way to do it. And it, it really does echo that theme in a way that, that I think Delta and, and Michelle, I know you've got comments here, really does in just both literally and, and, and visually uh, explicit, explicitly. Yeah, I think what we often see when we talk about tiers is brands creating tiers for tiers' sake, right? And what we're seeing more and more is brands with existing programs are just finding that the impact of the tiers isn't really delivering on that higher engagement. And when we dig deeper, it's usually because consumers feel like it's work to move up a level um, or it's too complicated to remember what you need to do from a spend and frequency threshold or the drivers and benefits like those carrots you mentioned really aren't motivating enough to move between levels. So I think that, you know, as we work through that, it's really important to build in more ways to move through those tiers than just those financial levers. And I know we talked about Adidas before, but I'm going to bring them back because they do this really, really well. Everything from, you know, social engagement to the consumption of content to, um, you know, progressive profiling, it's more than just your that enables you to develop that relationship with the brand. And then, as you said, it's including those experiential benefits, which Delta has really done a good job. As you get into the higher tiers, that's where you start seeing things like waived fees, seat upgrades. You know, Emirates Airline actually offered a choice of either early or late boarding, right? It's the inclusion of choice as part of your tiers. And so it's really looking at how are we utilizing tiers Uh, why are we creating tiers, what's the outcome, what's the measure of success, and also how are we, again, tying in recognition. Again, with Delta, they're not just using tiers to move people up so that on the back end they can move deciles or move frequency and spend. They're actually calling out your benefit during their interaction with you, right? Like, Phil, we've upgraded your seat today because you are part of a certain tier, not only is that making you feel special and recognized, but the other passengers are also hearing this dialogue and now curious and interested 
as to, oh, how is that happening? What do I need to pay attention to? Yeah, they literally, Delta does it, does a great job of that, which is also a, a perfect segue into the last topic we're going to talk about before opening it up for questions. And it's great to see all these questions in the chat. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to these in just a couple of minutes. Um, the other thing that tiers do is they drive interest in extending the relationship into their payment, their, their personal payment strategy with, with, in terms of interest in co-brand cards. And <clears throat> that's another area where the integration of payments and loyalty, not a new topic, hugely important and, and hugely important for all kinds of reasons, which of course we saw during the pandemic. We'll show you the top three here, the top three co-brand credit cards. We look at these a number of different ways, but looking at Disney Southwest and Marriott, no coincidence that they're all three very strong brands. They're all three brands focused on delivering unique and, and highly valuable experiences. And yes, there's a transactional dimension to these, but interestingly what they do, because the notion of what the card enables starts with this foundational value proposition that by its very nature, every time you swipe a card or contactless payment or Apple Pay, Google Pay, blah, 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 blah um, it's reinforcing the value proposition. And what that does is it creates loyalty disproportionately to the value proposition. So what you see, again, Marriott, a new program in a very crowded space reflecting the merger of Starwood and, and, and Marriott, really being one of the top performers in terms of loyalty to the program. But importantly, to everything we've talked about today, one of the things that Marriott does exceptionally well is it integrates their co-brand tender, this is why I use one of these, to both elevate your tier status. And, you know, the, if, if, again, like the higher you are in a tier, regardless of tender, but especially with tender, the more you're focused on the experience because in an accrual-based loyalty proposition where those points are redeemable, you, you've got plenty of financial sort of open to buy with your loyalty currency. What you want, though, is to make sure your experience is, is consistently elevated. Marriott's a great example of this. Uh, Michelle, are yeah, you I, I, yeah, I totally agree, Phil. I think this is such a great brand experience to pay attention to, especially because a lot of marketers are considering how do we start integrating experiences into our credit card offering, or even how do we start integrating our loyalty program and our credit card offering. And I really think Marriott has found a great balance within all of it. Often you think co-brand cards aren't really the first in wallet. But when we talk to customers, regardless of what sector, we almost always hear that it's hard not to have Marriott be one of your cards just because of the perks. And the difficult decision is just which Marriott card to get. Now, wouldn't marketers love to be in that situation, right? But they really did find a sweet spot with the right balance of monetary and experiential rewards um, that I think not only garner satisfaction and advocacy, but I think it also does the work of incremental behavior, which is important. And, you know, there was a question in the chat, are programs creating a higher tier that is premium and are they successful with those? And I think that also falls into credit card, right? Where credit cards are almost using those fee base as an additional tier. If you have your base program, you may have tiers within your base program, but then they're moving a lot of some of those experiential benefits into their co-brand card, um, which often does have a fee. So it really is this play, uh, which we're now seeing with, loyalty and co-brands and peers all really formulating together into, again, it's all about creating the customer-centric experience versus all these different products that we typically would have envisioned them as. Yeah, it, it totally underscores the willingness of, of consumers to pay, to literally pay for the better experience. And, you know, importantly for, for the sponsor of, that of, of that financial product, the, the brand. And we saw this across, you know, certainly across the airline industry with, with sort of the, 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 uh, the, the cratering of travel. They literally were existential because of the financial payments 
to the airlines from the cre- from their from their co-brand partners, it literally kept them in business. So um, perfect way to kind of take a pause. Let's recap what we talked about today, and and then we'll we'll give you a little bit more, tad more info on on the loyalty report, and then and then get to some of the great questions in the chat. The importance of customer experience as as the way to differentiate your brand and and especially that notion of being a loyalty brand delivering a loyal customer experience right we've we've often talked about the idea that transactional loyalty drives neither well today that's more more true than ever um and then when you think about recognizing customers showing loyalty to them helping to meet or raise or exceed their expectations that's really where tiers make a huge difference, not just making customers feel like you're loyal to them, but unlocking those experiences. And when you start to lump in subscription fees, co-brand credit card fees, you actually get to realize the financial value back to to deliver those better customer experiences. Um, it's, It's obviously impossible to cover everything that's in the loyalty report um, today. We're not going to do that. But what we just one, you know, 30 seconds more on the loyalty report before our questions. Go to our website, download the executive summary. You can reach out to us. The amazing thing about what we are doing now with this, especially when you think back to the drivers that, that Michelle and I talked about, is they're actionable. You can actually understand which customers value which drivers. We do that with of things like boosting the sample for your brand with the loyalty report, taking in behavioral data and actually combining the behavioral data and the attitudinal data, using that for benchmarking, and then not just using it for program design or program, you know, we do a lot of program evaluation, program diagnosis, but more importantly, how do you then bring that? And I know this was one of the questions in the chat about how do you do personalization? Well, the way you do personalization especially relevant personalization, because personalization by itself is not always relevant, is you understand how these drivers array for different customers, different customer segments, and you integrate that into their customer experience, into the different customer touch points, into the customer marketing that you do. So enough about that. We'll, we'll, we'll turn it over and, and let's open it up, Bill, so we can, uh, we can talk about some of these, some of the questions in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to thank you both, Michelle, Phil. That was a great overview. And it's a difficult thing to do when you have such a comprehensive report to try to whittle it down just to a few key comments within 40 minutes or so. So uh, thanks for whetting my appetite and making me crazy to want to know more. (laughs) That's the first thing. But I also want to encourage people because I have read the executive summary and it's, it is so worth the download. It's not your typical executive summary. It's, it's, Got a lot of information and a good bit of detail there. So make sure you go to the website and, and download it. So a lot of questions, you really piqued some curiosity about tiers, which is interested, uh, interesting. Um, and two of them in, in companion with each other, I just want to pose to you. What's your opinion regarding the introduction of a subscription model as part of the program in case you didn't have that from the beginning? And then another person said, what's a way to test tiers and market to see what's motivating, but doesn't alienate other consumers. Those two go together somewhat. I, I'll, take the, I'll take the second one, Michelle, and I'll let you, let you talk to the first one. I, I, I think the testing is, there's so many really cool ways to do testing in a relatively opaque way. So you're not telegraphing things competitively or even resetting customer expectations. But the the interesting thing, and and there are certain brands that have unpublished tiers. There are certain brands that have both published tiers and unpublished tiers. The the best way to test it is by not calling them tiers, but, but actually exposing customers to tiered experiences, to differentiated experiences. So you can do that in reality. You can also do that with a technique that we use called pre-typing, which we borrowed from Google, which allows you to expose customers to those types of propositions in a way that you can test their behavior, but you don't actually have to fulfill it. And I know that sounds a bit cheeky. It's not as cheeky as it sounds. It's actually the way Google 
uh, ferrets out all the ideas that Googlers provide. And that's that's how we used it. And we repurposed that for, for actually doing this kind of testing. Yeah, I totally um, agree with that. And yeah, we're definitely seeing subscription programs come into the market more and more. Um, and I would say across a number of different sectors. Uh, brands are really finding um, they're getting a lot of value from it. Um, but I think the main thing is how to continue and maintain the engagement. Um, there, there is a lot of uh, excitement that comes from the onset, a lot of value that's put into uh, the subscription. But then with the market being so competitive as it is, it's really about how do you continuously look to evolve the subscription program? How does the subs subscription program fit within all the other facets that you're providing the customer with? So you aren't really taking from one to give to another and then devaluing the entire product and making sure you're keeping the continuity of is the customer continuously going to be engaged as they get into renewing on that subscription, um, you know, annually or quarterly or whatever it is. And I think a big part of subscription now is, um, is the integration of sustainability. And how do we start looking at those societal values um, that are becoming hugely critical in terms of foundational values? And where does that paid for experience connect back to a larger um, environmental or social offering? Okay, that's great. So shift a little bit. Here's, here's a question that I've heard often and I've never, uh, I think it's just one of those unresolved issues. Um, what's the best advice you have for premium brands that have long purchase cycles? You know, it could be a automobile, beds, mattresses, anything to build brand advocacy. Do you have any examples of a brand that's doing a great job at this? I can jump in on that. Actually, sure. we've seen a lot of brands take cues, uh, interestingly enough, from um, you know, from your DoorDashes of the world and your Uber Eats in terms of being transparent and visible over the long cycle time. And, uh, you know, when, especially furniture, I think a lot of furniture brands, uh, a few that we've worked with recently, who've incorporated this model, because in these types of long purchase cycles, uh, you have this high excitement at the beginning, at the discovery um, of the product of the purchase cycle. And then the biggest pain point comes in the wait and the delivery, right? And so a lot of what they're doing is opening up that cycle to continuously communicate with customers as to what is happening. Almost like your Uber Eats lets you know your order is being prepared. Your or someone's on its way to pick it up. They're going to be there soon. And you know, a lot of them have again tied into where is it being manufactured? How are we giving back to the different parts of the world that are manufacturing this? Where is the fabric coming from? Um, where can they start thinking about alternative consulting services to, you know, plan the rest of their purchase cycle when it comes to, you know, once this item is now delivered? Um, so I think there's a lot to think about in terms of where we borrow from other sectors and look at similar types of experiences delivering on experience um, that I think lend well to, again, building that brand advocacy and creating, um, you know, taking those pain points and turning them into moments of uh, satisfaction. Yeah, that's yeah, great. That, just to add one thing to that. It, one thing that we did this year inside the loyalty report, instead of, instead of just ranking all the brands collectively, we actually broke them into low, medium, and high frequency categorization so that we can look at insights relative to frequency because it's a great question. The other one, the other example I would point to uh, who really led, led this uh, in their category, especially from sort of a, like a, a broader customer base was when mini launched and you had to order a mini, they would, they would send you regular updates as your vehicle was being produced. Like literally your vehicle show you pictures and really merchandise the anticipation to mitigate. How do you be paid? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you create patience? Again, that value of time, but also transparency. Great. Thanks for that, Phil. Hey, here's one a little bit different. There's some practical questions in here. This one's just asking, 
how might a brand design their own version of a loyalty driver analysis, the one that you were talking about? Um, assume that I'm starting at the very beginning and hint, my brand doesn't need to put heavy emphasis on attrition or spend. That's, that's kind of a riddle. That's almost a, a question with a riddle. <laughs> well, it's not the easiest one, but I mean, yeah. the, part of part of the way you do that is you really have to understand what I mean, you can take our driver framework and 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 repurpose that or version that for your brand. But ultimately, you have to get to and those the drivers are intentionally broad and, and inside of TLR, there's there's like 37 different attributes that roll up to those seven. So, so there's a lot of different ways to get to those drivers, but ultimately you've got to have the insights to feed into how you organize those drivers. And we've been working with this system for a number of years now. It, it, it's versatile enough, but it's also structural enough that it allows for customization within different categories. But if you don't want, if you want to literally create your own bespoke drivers, I think the way one of the ways you do that is you've got to do that with some very in-depth qualitative research to then feed the, the the quantitative, the quantification of it across a bigger a bigger base of customers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I think this might be tapping in a little bit to the idea of the importance of access and time savings, but there are a couple of questions about mobile apps and the role they play in loyalty programs today. And, you know, one is just asking about to what extent do loyalty programs rely on mobile apps to be successful now? And then do you have any stats or or what can you just share in general about how loyalty programs can influence app usage and retention? I mean, the the apps do, do a couple of things. I mean, they create addressability in a, in a privacy compliant way today. And I, I'll go back to that McDonald's example where really the app drives loyalty because it enhances, it accelerates, it makes the experience more seamless, more relevant to the customer. Um, so there's, there's definitely a yin and yang to that. I think what we saw early on is there were apps over here and there were loyalty programs over here and they weren't well integrated. So again, that integration so that it's both the value proposition and the mechanism and the brand collectively delivering that better experience is is at the foundation of how you answer that question. Um, Some of it depends on your category. Some of it depends on how strong your brand. A lot of this is a function of how strong your brand is. The stronger that your brand is, the more latitude you have to curate experiences through what we what what a lot of people would consider non-traditional loyalty strategies, non you know loyalty programs in air quotes. They're programmatic things, but they're not necessarily packaged as a program. The challenge is you want the you want not just the opt-in through the app. You want a higher level of engagement, like an opt-up from that. Yeah, what I'd add to that is on your last note, Phil, is I think it's proven time and time again that an app is successful at driving incremental engagement. You will see um, a higher spend, a higher frequency, also higher cross-category purchasing uh, coming, coming from a consumer of your program that is also utilizing your app. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is you tap into moments of impulse where you can go to them um, and create engagement without them coming to look for you. Um, it is also a bit of, you know, and how brands utilize it, it is the fear of missing out, right? It is what can they market, what can they promote, what can they communicate? Um, but a larger part is the app strategy and how siloed, again, is it from the overall brand that Phil talked about? If you have, you know, a brand app, you have a loyalty app, you may have an experience or a functional app, um, that together is not really going to create your satisfaction or your experience. It's how are you, again, being customer-centric in your strategy? How are these things feeding off each other, be it singular, be it sister apps, be it some connection points? But at a high level, I would say apps and loyalty programs are fundamentally connected and if used correctly, 
uh, it definitely drives a much more valuable long-term customer relationship. Mm-hmm. Agree, agree. So in respect to everyone's time, trying to be loyal back to this great audience that we had here today, I, I just want to leave people a few more minutes before they have to jump on their next call or go try to grab a bite during the middle of the day. So I, I think we can wrap up here, but I wanted to leave just a bit of space if either Phil or Michelle, do you have any other just closing remarks or anything that's on your mind that you'd want to share? And otherwise, I know that people could go to the website and download that executive summary, and learn more. Yeah, I would just say thanks. Thanks to the Wise Marketer group and, and this great, great engagement from the audience. Thanks for all the, the we didn't get to nearly enough questions, uh, but the value of time says we should give you back some time. And Michelle, great to do this with you. And uh, hopefully we'll all see each other soon in three dimensions. That's great. Michelle? Likewise. Uh, this was great. Thank you for hosting us, Bill. Um, appreciate the, the spectrum of questions. I love how it came from very different topics um, and really touched on a lot of things. And, you know, um, it was always great to kind of um, talk about experiences and how we can move things along, especially in this new phase of our world. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, I'm even thinking, I, I want to thank you both so much again. Thank Bond for taking leadership in this area because it's um, we're so desperate for quantitative information and just research driven insights so that we can help create the next generation of loyalty programs out there. But thanks to you both. Maybe we'll come up with an idea of just spending 40 minutes of nothing but Q&A with you two. So we'll, we'll talk about that and maybe the audience will get a chance to ask the questions remaining and more. But to anyone who didn't get their question answered, we're going to make sure and send those along to Phil and Michelle and and you'll get an answer back. And again, just thank you all so much and um, have a wonderful day from all of us. Thank you.